I was glad when he said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for this church, for this country where we can come and worship freely. I ask your continued blessings on each of us here, and I ask a special blessing on those of our General Assembly who are not here today, that they might be back with us soon. Please forgive us the mistakes that we make. Please guide us to forgive one another. And please guide us to forgive ourselves as we seek to come closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise when we all get to heaven, number 514. Please stand.
turn and greet your neighbour by passing the peace of Christ. Carry on, carry on. Welcome everybody, especially if you're visiting. We notice we have some visitors there. If someone will be sure that they'll get a card to fill out, we'll get them, get them registered and, and be able to welcome them further in the future. Notice in your bulletins an array of, of happenings. We continue our week of prayer for the state missions offering. And you notice there how you can give to that offering. On October the 1st, the four B's will take a neat trip, lunch at Serafini's, and a tour of the Kentucky History Museum. Bus will leave at 1015. Bring chicken noodle soup or a dish detergent for Clark County Community Center or dish detergent. Thursday, we have a Bible study that will begin at 6 p.m. October the 1st. That's a week from Thursday. Study led by Joanne Dove. You notice there how you can secure a book. Uh, you notice also how to contact Joanne to sign up, or you can call the church office. That'll be a good study on Thursday evenings for eight sessions. Then on October the 4th, our Sunday school banquet here at the church at 5.30, our guest speaker Rodney Lynch, the associate pastor of Westport Baptist Church in Louisville. October 7 is Outreach Wednesday. We hope that someone will show up from your Sunday school class to make visits for your class. Are there other announcements? Apparently not. Let's continue in worship by singing our offertory hymn number 338. Standing as we sing, how firm a foundation.
Susan Nally, would you lead us in our offertory prayer? Our Father, we are thankful for the privilege of gathering here and the freedom to worship you. Lord, we live in a world where our excess of excess where our wants seem to always exceed our needs. May we be reminded that the world needs you and that we are commanded to share your word. Let us give freely and abundantly so that these offerings can be used to provide for the needs of others and their hearts can be open to the truth of Jesus Christ. In your name I pray, amen. Please take note of our prayer list in your bulletin. We have several that have lost loved ones this past week. We extend sympathy to Wendy Whitaker and her family in the passing of her brother-in-law, Ray Sanchez, and to Ada Adams and family on the passing of her niece, Patricia King Mickler. And we extend our thoughts to the family and friends of Mariana Steele Neely, who passed away. We also remember in hospitals, uh, Buck Dobson at the Leestown Road Medical Center of the Veterans Administration. His room number is there. Hazel Nichols recuperating at home from knee surgery and Paul Blanton from back surgery. Zella Saylor, Ben Schwanner, Elizabeth Ann Spall, and others that we keep in our thoughts every time that we worship. Our thinking and message today will come from the book of Acts, chapter 18, concerning an individual that we read about and preached about a couple of weeks ago in the Labor Day season, a young man named Apollos, Acts chapter 18, verses 24 and following. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and expounded to him the way of the Lord more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to receive him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully confuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. May God bless this reading of his word as we pray together. Our Father, may we be mindful of your presence as we gather, your abiding grace and forgiveness of our sin as we confess it openly, your majesty as we seek to come in reverence, and adoration, your instruction as we open your sacred written word and seek to commune with the living word, Jesus of Nazareth, your son, and your challenge 
as we plan to depart this place, may we do so with resolve to take whatever inspiration, truth, mission that we derive from your word in worship to this hurting world around us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I gave the choir a chance to sit down there with you, but they're going to stay where they are. Sometimes they get a little warm up there under those lights. We got one of our air conditioners down.
Did your high school yearbook have a section most likely to succeed? Some of them did. Who was in that section? Were you in that section? I was not. What are the, or did, when you were entering your courtship years, did you think about, I want to date the guy or the girl that's most likely to succeed? Maybe such thoughts ran across your minds. If not yours, maybe your parents' minds. <laughs> I heard a little story about Julie and Johnny. They were in love. And Johnny said, Julie, I'm not rich like Jerome Green, but I sure do love you. I don't have a new boat like Jerome Green, but I sure do love you. I notice he drives a Jaguar. I don't have a Jaguar like Jerome Green, but I sure do love you. And Julie looked into his eyes and said, Johnny, I love you too. Tell me a little more about this Jerome Green. <laughs> what does it mean to be successful? It is a matter of definition. What does it mean to go to bed early and early to rise so that you'll be what? We know that one, don't we? Has that worked for everybody? It didn't work for Jesus, did it? Do you consider your life a success? What are the secrets? What are the elements? What are the ingredients of success? Now, I want to give a qualifier at the opening here. There's a difference between motivational speaking and preaching the gospel. They're not the same thing. That's often confused, but they're not the same thing. The gospel is chiefly about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the grace and forgiveness of sin found therein. But having said that, this good old book is filled with good tips, ingredients of what the Bible thinks is successful living. Things like, what does it mean to have a life that is fruitful rather than barren? Full rather than empty? Hopeful rather than helpless? Abundant rather than cheap? Jesus said, I came that they might have life. What kind of life? more abundantly. We need to remember sometimes that Jesus enjoyed life. It's not that he didn't suffer. It's not that he didn't experience pain, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but he celebrated the fun of life too. He went to wedding feasts. They called him sometimes a glutton and a wine bibber because he ate and drank with publicans and sinners. He liked red-blooded people and good, real fun. But he was successful. What is abundant life? I've chosen for an example this morning, not a superstar of the New Testament. Not Peter, James, or John that are often listed in that litany of the super Christians. But a guy named Apollos. Now we know his name, but we probably don't know much about him. He is in the New Testament seven times, I believe, he's mentioned. That's a good biblical word. And we learn from these little vignettes that he was a Jew from Alexandria, Egypt. And Alexandria was where the schools of higher learning in that part of the ancient world existed. Scholars went to Alexandria to get educated, students to become scholars. That's where the graduate schools were. That's where the seminaries were. Over a million people lived there. He was an Alexandrian Jew. He was not this superstar, but he was a probably a first stringer, if you will, in the history of the early church. A couple of weeks ago, I preached from 1 Corinthians and cited the first chapter and I believe the third chapter, both in both of which cases, Apollos is mentioned. In chapter 1, Paul says, For it has been reported to me, he's writing to the Corinthian church, by Chloe's family, that there is quarreling among you. 
My brethren, what I mean is that some of you say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or Peter, or I belong to Christ. The church there is divided into parties at Corinth, and, and Apos, Apollos is viewed as one of the party leaders, if you will. And then Paul in the fifth chapter, third chapter writes, what is Apollos? What is Paul? We're just servants by whom you believed, as the Lord assigned each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God always is the one who gives growth. We don't in the Bible. We plant, we water, but it's always God who gives or does not give the growth. We are just God's fellow workers. So you see, Apollos is named here as an almost rival of the Apostle Paul in his stature. He's mentioned a few more times in the New Testament after this. In the book of Acts, he's finally mentioned for the last time in the book of Titus where he's planning yet another missionary journey, another ministry to perform in his life. Ever since Martin Luther, who was the first New Testament scholar to believe this, there have been other scholars that have come along and said, you know, there's a book in the New Testament that has no, no author. We can't figure out who the author is for sure. And Martin Luther thought, and many other scholars have thought, maybe Apollos wrote this book of Hebrews because it is fraught with the application of the literary tool allegory. The whole book of Hebrews is, in a sense, an allegory, and Alexandria was the center of allegorical study of the scriptures. So could it be that the apostle or that, that Apollos wrote this book? But be that as it may, if, if Apollos is our model for successful living today, and he's a good one because he's not the superstar that I never could hope to be. He was just kind of an ordinary individual who succeeded. And why did he succeed? Well, first of all, I want to suggest that Apollo succeeded in part because he had gifts, but mainly because he used them. We are told in verse 24, he was an eloquent man, a gifted man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed well in the way of the Lord. He'd been to seminary at Alexandria. He was fervent in the spirit. And all that's great, but the most important thing was that, as the verse continues, he taught what he knew. In the book of Ephesians or the book of 1 Corinthians, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, we read about the fact that God in Christ gave gifts to everybody, even me. There are some individuals who are multi-gifted. There are some who have only one gift. But if the New Testament is true, Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit has given gifts to everyone here today. He's gifted. There's one thing that we can't do anything about when we're born, and that's our DNA, our abilities, what we have and what we don't have. That's already settled, isn't it? All we can do when we are born again in Christ is discover what gifts God may have dealt out to us and then use them or not use them. The most important trait that Apollos had was not so much that he had gifts, but that he applied them, that he used them. Probably everybody here today knows the parable of the talents. When the householder gave out various degrees of money to his three servants. And two of them used them and invested them. And when the master came back, he said, here's the growth of your talent. But one of them buried them because he didn't want to lose it. But you know what? He lost it. When the master came back, he took it away from him and gave it to one who had made an investment of what he left behind. We would all like to be born geniuses, I suppose, but few of us are. What's important is not what we're born with, but what we do with it. I had a coach one time that used to say, fellas, it's not so important what happens to you in life as how you handle it, what you do in response to it. You can't control what happens to you. 
I saw on the news the other day, I don't believe, I don't remember which university it was. I think it was an Ivy League school. It may have even been Harvard or Yale that made a massive change in their policy regarding admitting students, always having used high scores on the SAT and ACT and such entrance exams. They decided to throw that out and to use the grades that the student had made in high school in their coursework. Having decided, we have discovered that it's not necessarily the most gifted student that goes the farthest, but the one who applies what he or she has. It's not what you rank, they said. It's what you render with what you are given. This is the most challenging thing for every teacher in every classroom. Yes, the standardized test can be given and the teacher can know Johnny and Julie or whomever has this kind of aptitude. Remember the aptitude tests in seventh and eighth grade and junior high where you take these tests and they tell you what you ought to do <laughs> or what you maybe can do, where are your gifts? But the bottom line is always, well, now that I know, what am I going to do, isn't it? That's the only thing that I can control. What am I going to do? The oil people go out and find whether there's oil beneath by various instrumentation. And guess what? If there's no oil here, what, they, what do they not do? They don't drill. <laughs> but if there's oil here, that's well and good, but it's useless unless you what? Drill. Maybe that's a bad illustration in today's climate. You have to use what you have. Helen Keller couldn't see, couldn't hear, and couldn't speak. But there was a teacher that thought there's something there. I'm going to drill for it. Thank God she did and broke through. And here was a brilliant lady who had been born with physical handicaps, but the talent was there. It had to be you discovered and used. Apollos had it, but Apollos used it, or we would never have heard of Apollos, no matter how much he'd been given at birth or new birth. Jesus had taught earlier, and maybe Apollos had read it in one of the ancient manuscripts concerning him to whom much has been given. Of him much is required. In the judgment day, the scriptures are playing on the principle that we will be evaluated not on the basis of what we might have done or should have done or could have done, but on the basis of what? What we did do. Apollos had talent, and he used it, you see. He used it. What made Isaiah stand out? It was not that he was such a gifted young prophet. It was that he overheard the heavenly counsel, the Lord saying in a vision in the temple, whom shall I send who will go for us? He didn't say, here I am, I can. He said, here I am, I will send me. That great hymn, maybe I should have chosen for the invitation hymn, the kingdom of God and its work is made up not of whosoever can, but whosoever what? Will. Most failure in life is not caused by people who are trying to do what they cannot do or don't know how to do. It is by people who will not do what they can do. That's the biggest cause of failure. James had walked with Jesus, perhaps, heard him preach and teach, and when right in his little book, the first chapter, I think the 22nd verse, do not be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, thus deceiving yourselves, he would then write. He was, he was hot on hypocrisy. For James, if you heard the word and did not do it, I'm deceiving myself that I'm saved and that I'm walking with Christ because I've heard the word and can quote the word and know what chapter and verse it's in. No, I'm a Christian when I do the word, you see. Apollos wasn't just gifted, 
He wasn't just instructed well in Alexandria in the ways of the word, but he went about doing the word, sharing the word, and thus he made a difference. We have begun a new church year at First Baptist Church. Maybe you're a teacher, an officer, you have a class, you have some sort of position on a committee or whatever. Be doers of the word, servants of the word. We all like being comfortable at church. We pad our pews. We air condition the atmosphere. We work to keep the building comfortable. We enjoy fellowship with one another, and we sure eat well. Come to potluck once a month and know that. And we all enjoy that. And fellowship is wonderful, and it's part of church life. But fellowship is not the end. We're called not just to have fellowship. We're called to be fellow workers, servants, service, you see. A church without servants, without mission, might be a good club. But it's not Christ, the body of Christ. Who was it that said the role of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted? And I like that role. I like to comfort the afflicted, but he also turned it around and said it's also to afflict the comfortable. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. It's good to be comfortable, but let's not get too comfortable. Let's be servants. We've been gifted. This church is extremely gifted. Now we also be doers and use the gifts that we have. That's the secret of success in any realm of life. Second secret that Apollos demonstrated was that he, he may have appeared to know everything. He got a good education. He's a hot shot young preacher boy. But when he went to Corinth, some folks pulled him aside, Aquila and Priscilla, and gave him some counsel. And he took it. He took it. Luke writes, quote, he taught accurately concerning the things of Jesus. He was not accurate. He was not inaccurate. He just didn't quite have the whole story. And therefore, and that's okay. All we can do is teach what we know. But when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside. In the Greek here, it's clear that they took him aside privately. They didn't embarrass him publicly. They took him aside privately and compassionately and expanded the way of the Lord to him more perfectly, as the King James says. They expanded the way of the Lord to him more accurately. We're not exactly sure of what that it was about. Luke tells us he knew about the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. You know, at Antioch, they had to be instructed a little more about Jesus. They didn't have the whole story yet. And there's something that, that, that Apollos didn't quite have complete yet. And so they, they pulled him aside and instructed him more accurately. And he went about doing his work even better. He was... Paul, what we used to say, coachable, coachable. Sometimes the, the greatest athlete on the field, if he's not coachable, if he doesn't listen, if he can't take counsel, will never reach his or her potential. This guy was a rival to the Apostle Paul. He could have told Priscilla and Aquila, neither of whom had a seminary education, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't you know that I'm a graduate of the School of Religion in Alexandria, Egypt, the School of Allegorical Interpretation? But he didn't do that. My grandfather used to tell us grandkids, never forget that every man on the street can teach you something. And we could all take the lesson of being better listeners. It doesn't mean that we have to Follow every bit of advice because some people spout advice like, advice like old faithful guys or they know what everybody ought to do differently, even if you don't ask them. But on the other hand, wisdom is the ability to filter through some of that and realize, you know, I need to hear that. I need to, I need to rethink this or that. And to be otherwise is what we call in our children hard-headed. You know, all children... No, I, shouldn't, I can't say that. I wish all children got good counsel as they grew up. Not all children do, but many children do. 
But the ones that surely amount to most grace are the ones who listen and try to follow the counsel that they receive. They expanded the way of the Lord to him more perfectly. And he took it and revised his message a bit. And you see here in Apollos and in the experience with Aquila and Priscilla, who were mentioned throughout the New Testament when Paul went to Corinth, he took up with them, stayed in their house 18 months. They were, they were tent makers like Paul, but didn't have the education like Paul at the feet of Gamaliel, but they got it from Paul. They're, they're main players. They're kind of like Apollos. In fact, there's one theory that, that Priscilla wrote the book of Hebrews. Interesting to pursue that. But it's clear that when they took him aside, they took him aside because they loved him. Their, their criticism was constructive. They wanted him to do better. They did not want to expose his faults and bring him down and make him look bad. They, it was constructive criticism, you see. And that's part of what we all have to ferret out when we get advice, is this someone that's trying to help me or someone that's trying to hurt me? That's a major ingredient. And, and Apollos discerned that they wanted to help him. They wanted to lift him up. Thank all of you who have helped this pastor. And I need to go back to Gumlick Baptist Church and Finchfield Baptist Church when I was a young preacher boy of the people that helped me learn how to serve. They didn't have seminary educations, but they were educated in the, in the school of life, and they're necessary, the Barnabases of our lives, the encouragers, those who lift us up and help us when we need it. They're so vitally important. Priscilla and Aquila have always been special to me for that reason. Barnabas, or Apollos, had gifts, and he used them. He received counsel and he took it. And finally, he had worthy goals and he pursued them. Both have to be in place. In verse 27, we read, and he wished after this to go on to Achaia. He received this counsel in Ephesus to go on to Achaia. Why? Because Corinth was there, that big city and that church that was struggling with divisions within it. He wanted to go to Achaia. And the verse continues, and when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. He not only had the goal of going, he by George went, you see. He had a worthy goal, and he pursued it. He pursued it. I still remember the days of feeling called to the ministry and looking at the educational pilgrimage in front of me and think, oh, college, 90-hour, 100-hour Masters of Divinity program and then a doctoral program. I'll be in school all my life. And I have to confess to you that when I started the doctoral program and got ABD, you know what that is? All but the dissertation. <laughs> I, I thought, am I going to get an ABD degree that a lot of them did? Because writing that final dissertation was tough. And I started it. And you know the main reason I finished it? Because I started it. <laughs> That's all. And, and looking back, that goal. Having the goal was fine, but it's pursuing the goal that was the greatest challenge and staying after the goal when many times we want to quit. They asked Evil Knievel, you remember him? Why in the world do you do what you do? And he said, there's three, th I'll never forget this. I've shared it with you before. I suspect I wrote it down as a young man. His four sons didn't have any better sense to pursue the same goal. He said, there are three things nobody knows. He says, the first is nobody knows why they do what they do. Second, nobody knows where they came from. Third, nobody knows where they're going. I thought, those are exactly the things I want to know, don't you? I want to have a goal in life. I want to know why I'm doing what I'm doing, whether I'm doing it well or not. Joseph Addison wrote, quote, three things are necessary for a successful life. Something to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Well, the gospel gives us each of those things. Apollos had a worthy goal. 
to share the gospel of the Lord in Corinth. But more important than that, or certainly as important, is that he carried it out. Some years ago, a fellow handed me a piece of wood about that big around. What was it? It said on it, round to it. Did you ever get around to it? Spelled T-U-I-T. He gave me this round to it. We've got to get around to it, to doing it. Nike came out with the theme some years ago and sold a lot of tennis shoes. And what, what was their theme? Just do it. Just do it. Quit talking about it and do it. He wanted to go and he went. And when he arrived, we're told that he did a great job. Goals are important. Purpose is important. But when it's all said and done, as we learned in seminary, there's a whole lot more said than done. Christianity is about saying it, yes, believing it, yes, knowing it, yes, but in the end, doing it. The wheel's got to hit the road. The feet have got to hit the pavement. And don't quit. Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison was asked midway through his life, he tried to invent this, that, and the other, and one failure after another, one failure after another. He was asked about what he's going to do the rest of his life. He said, I'm going to succeed, quote, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. He continues, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. And the most certain way to succeed is always to just try one more time. And after he said that, According to this author, he invented the light bulb, the phonograph, and paved the way for motion pictures in the early, late 1800s and early 1900s, for which Walt Disney will always be grateful because he used all of his discoveries. Don't quit. What is your goal in life? Don't quit. I wasn't going to tell this story because it's got a little bit of length to it, but it's only 1154. I've changed my mind. It was 1952. 1952. Off to the coast of California on Catalina Island where a 34-year-old girl, Florence Chadwick, planned to swim to California 21 miles. She'd tried it before. And it had usually been the cold water rather than the fatigue that had made her quit. No one had ever done it. And on July 4th, 1952, she started out for the coast of California. Her mother and trainer in the boat beside her and riflemen who had to shoot the sharks to keep them away from her as she swam. After 15 hours and 55 minutes, she said, I'm done. I'm, I'm frozen. It wasn't the fatigue, it was the icy cold water. I'm getting out. And her mother and her trainer said, no, don't get out. You're close to the end. And she looked up and in the dense fog, she couldn't see her goal in front of her. So they got her out of the water. And when she finally thawed out, they discovered she was less than a half a mile from the beach. And she wept and said, if I had only known I was that close I would never have quit. Don't quit on any worthy goal that you have for your life. You might be really close. I close with the words of Apollos. Maybe. The book of Hebrews, 12th chapter, verse 1. To all the saints, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight that doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us until we finish. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And God's people said, Amen. may we pray. Our Father, we are grateful for the example of Apollos, not a superstar of the New Testament, but one perhaps ordinary like so many of us, who was willing to use the gifts that he had, complete the journey that he began, and take the counsel that he received. May he be our model as we continue to serve in the days ahead. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Our hymn of invitation is number 277, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. If you seek membership at First Baptist or have a statement to make regarding your relationship with God, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Please remain standing just a minute. Pat Overby, one of our newer members, has come to reaffirm her faith in Christ on the anniversary of her birthday, which, is, which was yesterday, and to thank you for making me feel young. The family for making you feel young yesterday. I feel old today, though. Oh, you feel old today? Well, you're, you're only one day older than you were yesterday. I don't know what it was. It didn't sink in. Good, good to have you and celebrate your birthday, amen, and, and as a new member of our church. Moved here from Stanton. She knows about Nada. Come and rejoice with her in this decision. May we bow together for our closing prayer, and I'll ask uh, Ira Brashear, if you would, to lead us, please, in our benediction. <laughs> 